Back in spring of 2015, Christian von Koenigsegg told reporters that free valve technology is getting ready for fruition. But a lot of the stuff we're doing, and especially our sister company Freeval, is now trickling down into also more normal cars. In November 2016, Chinese automobile manufacturer Coros Auto displayed the Coros 3 hatchback at the Guangzhou Motor Show. This car featured a Camus cam-free engine using free valve technology. The Coros 3 never left the concept stage and never became a mass production reality. In 2020, the Koenigsegg Jamiro was unveiled. It featured a 2-liter inline 3-cylinder engine with free valve that makes 600 horsepower. Production of the Jamiro was supposed to begin in 2021. The date has since been moved to 2024. So it's been 8 years since free valve was officially announced. But today, in 2023, it seems that we are no closer to this technology being reality than we were back in 2015. So why is that? Well, that's exactly what I'll attempt to answer in this video. But more importantly, I will explain why free valve isn't as big of a deal as it initially seems and why it's very possible that this technology may never become mainstream mass production reality. Now, don't get me wrong. I like free valve. I would love to see it happen. I would love to own and drive a car with free valve. I think it's definitely cool technology. And I think that Koenigsegg, without any doubt, makes amazing cars. But the common sense realist inside me is very skeptical. And to understand the reasons behind my skepticism and why I believe that free valve isn't game changer technology, we first must understand why free valve is touted as revolutionary technology that can dramatically improve engines. As you probably know, valves let fresh air in and exhaust out the engine and the camshaft is the physical metal programming for those valves. The cam determines when, how much and how long the valves open. The problem with a traditional fixed valve timing system is that our programming remains the same at all times. Once the camshaft is manufactured and ground, our valve timing is 100% fixed throughout the entire RPM range of the engine. So let's imagine we have to choose a camshaft for our engine and let's imagine we want to extract the maximum power from our engine. So we choose a cam with high lift and high duration. This lets in a lot of air. So we add a lot of fuel and we produce powerful fast combustion and make lots of power at high RPM. The problem is that we pay a very high price for this power. At the low RPM, our engine feels sluggish and unresponsive and our idle is rough and unstable and it produces high emissions. Why does this happen? Well, the answer is that low RPM means low piston speed. Low piston speed means low air velocity. Low air velocity means poor air and fuel mixing. Poor air and fuel mixing means poor combustion. Poor combustion means reduced torque. Now the key thing here is that air velocity and air quantity sort of work against each other. Now if you have a large opening, a large cross section, you have the potential for high air quantity or lots of air coming through that opening. But the larger your cross section, the lower your air velocity. Now, at low RPM and or low throttle openings, there really is no potential for high air quantity anyway. So what we want to do at low RPM is open the valves less so that we can increase air velocity and improve our air fuel mixing in order to restore some low RPM torque. But of course, reducing valve lift means that we lose some of our maximum uh, performance potential. The other problem we have is that our massive valve duration has led to high valve overlap. In other words, because our valves are open for a very long time, it means that both our intake and exhaust valves end up being open at the same time when the exhaust stroke ends and the intake stroke begins. At high RPM, this overlap works great. We have powerful and fast combustion, which leaves some hot and high pressure exhaust gases in the chamber. This creates a massive pressure difference between the exhaust manifold and the combustion chamber. So when the exhaust valves open, the exhaust gases rush out of the chamber like bats out of hell and leave a negative pressure wave behind them. 
because their speed is so high that the void they leave behind them acts like a vacuum. So the chamber is now at a lower pressure than the incoming fresh intake air, which of course helps to pull in the intake charge. This is called scavenging, and it improves high RPM performance because the piston now has to do very little work to push the exhaust gases out of the engine. The negative pressure inside the chamber almost acts like a mini supercharger because it pulls in more air than would otherwise be possible. But high valve overlap, which enables scavenging, also makes the engine idle like this. Yes, it sounds absolutely mean and cool, but it has no other benefits whatsoever. Uh, increased valve overlap at low RPM and idle reduces efficiency and increases emissions. And this is because at low RPM we have low piston speed and then we have poor air fuel mixing and then poor combustion quality, which means that the resulting exhaust gases aren't as hot and pressurized, so they don't escape out the exhaust manifold with the same velocity, so they don't also create a negative pressure wave in the chamber that doesn't pull in more fresh uh, air fuel mixture instead the exhaust gases are sort of sluggish and lethargic and because camshaft rotation speed is linked to crankshaft rotation speed and of course piston speed uh, at low rpm we're actually giving the exhaust gases more time to linger around and do undesirable things depending on how your valve timing is set up this may result uh, in the exhaust gases going into the intake and or the fresh air fuel mixture going out through the exhaust in increased uh, quantity Quantity. Of course, this leads to a rough running engine and increased emissions. So what we want to do is get rid or at least reduce valve overlap as much as possible to get a smooth idle and reduced emissions. But of course, getting rid of valve overlap means that we also lose our lovely scavenging effect at high RPM. So how do we fix all of this? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. Just get rid of the fixed metal programming and replace it with real infinitely variable programming. In other words, get rid of the camshaft and replace it with high-tech pneumatic hydraulic solenoids, one for each valve. And no longer is the valve opening speed a slave to the piston speed and the shape of your camshaft hope. The valve now opens near instantly and it remains open as much and as long as you want to. Your only real constraint now is to avoid hitting the piston. Everything else is infinitely variable. Your valve lift, your valve duration, your valve overlap and more importantly it's all infinitely variable independently from each other and this means that you can have it all. Dramatic performance at high RPM as well as great responsiveness, good torque and reduced emissions at low RPM and low throttle openings. Throttle openings, what am I even saying? Because if we can infinitely vary what the valves do, then we can use the valves to dictate how much air goes into the engine. We don't even need a throttle body anymore. And by getting rid of the throttle body, we improve efficiency because we reduce pumping losses. What are pumping losses? Try breathing through a straw. And as you will see, it requires increased effort. And increased effort is wasted energy. And that's exactly what the engine is doing. It's wasting energy when it's trying to ingest air through the tiny orifice provided by a throttle body that is only slightly open. So free valve is obviously amazing. Why then am I saying that it's not a big deal? It's not a big deal because what I just did is compare free valve to a fixed valve timing engine. And this is what free valve have been doing themselves. Back in 2016, they collaborated with Chorus to create the cam free engine, an engine with free valve technology. It made 230 horsepower from 1.6 liters of displacement. And back then, free valve claimed, and this is a direct quote, compared to a traditional engine, it offers a 50% reduction in size, 30% reduction in weight, 30% improvement in power and torque, 30% improvement in fuel economy, and a 50% reduction in emissions. The problem here is how do we define a traditional engine? Let's say that a traditional engine is an engine without free valve. Okay, here's a traditional engine from 2012. This is a 2012 Mini Cooper S John Cooper Works. It makes 211 horsepower from 1.6 liters of displacement. That is not 30% less. It's only 9% less. So apparently that's not a traditional engine. Then that means we have to lower our standards. Then let's say that a traditional engine is an engine without any sort of variable valve timing. Well, there's a problem. Nobody makes those anymore. Fixed valve timing engines went completely extinct, I think about 
10 years ago. Uh, what I described in the video, the, the valve lift duration being completely fixed, nothing variable, that's an engine from the early 80s. And here's another problem. The statement that free valve increases uh, power and torque by 30% hasn't aged very well. Case in point, 2023 Corolla GR. Camshafts, 1.6 liters, 300 horsepower. Funnily enough, that's 30% more than the free valve cam free engine. So in the eight years that free valve hasn't been on the market, traditional engines have done to free valve what free valve promised to do to them. But what about the tiny friendly giant that's 600 horsepower from two liters of displacement and only three cylinders? Surely that is proof that free valve is superior. Unfortunately, no. Free valve is at best a secondary reason why that engine makes 600 horsepower. The 600 horsepower comes from two bar of boost and eight and a half thousand RPM. Take a Honda K20 from 2001, shove two bar of boost into it and rev it to eight and a half thousand RPM and I guarantee you'll be making that sort of power. But it won't be reliable, right? Yes, it won't be reliable, but it also won't cost 1.7 million dollars. With enough money you can make anything. And I'm sure that any major manufacturer or even a good engine builder can build a 600 horsepower 2 liter 3 uh, cylinder engine that is both reliable and efficient and emissions friendly and whatever. But it will cost a lot of money and will therefore have very low demand. And this is why the Jamira will be made in 300 units but the GR Corolla will be sold in the thousands. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that an engine with free valve isn't better than an engine without free valve. Free valve is in theory better than anything with a camshaft. What I'm saying is that it's better by a thin margin and that margin in, is only getting thinner every year that free valve isn't on the market. And the, the more it stays out of the market, the less it makes sense to even introduce it. The key point of this video is that we have already achieved about 85 to maybe even 90% of what free valve can do. And by chasing the final 15 to 10%, free valve has entered into the area of painfully diminishing returns. The input and cost and effort required to achieve the final 10 to 15% may be greater than the output and results are worth. Here are some examples. Free valve doesn't need a throttle body. Well, neither does BMW's Valvetronic and it's been around since 2001. You want to open one valve more than the other? Valvetronic does that too and it has infinitely variable valve duration and lift. But free valve can do cylinder deactivation. Well, so can Volkswagen and many and many others. But this is just clever mechanical engineering. This is so industrial age, so passe. I don't want this. I want solenoids. No problem. Fiat has been doing solenoids since 2009 with multi-air. There's no intake camshaft in the traditional sense and valves are actually actuated by hydraulic pressure of the oil already present inside the engine. What's interesting with multi-air is that you have infinitely variable intake valve lift and duration and it's completely independent from each other and you can change it instantly. This means that you can have a completely different camshaft profile for every intake stroke, just like free valve. Want to open the intake valve twice during a single intake stroke? No problem, multi-air does that too. And it does all of it without needing an additional power sapping air compressor like free valve does. And if you were to take a multi-air or any other very modern engine and then replace the entire valve train on that same engine with free valve, I'm pretty sure that none of these percentages would be possible. Power efficiency and emissions, I doubt they would increase more than 10%, probably less. Some might be even as depressing as 4 or 5%. Now this is just an educated guess because there's no real data on free valve out there, no concrete numbers, just a lot of animations and announcements. Uh, but again, the simple physics inside an engine, they speak towards these very humble percentage increases. On the other hand, it's certain that the engine would probably cost double or even triple. But what about weight and size? Well, I can see how free valve reduces engine size. However, I don't see how it can reduce engine size by 50%.
Sure, it can reduce engine height because you get rid of the cams and the cam gears, but I don't see how it reduces total engine length. You get rid of the cam gears and the camshaft, you know, belt or chain. I can see there a reduction length there, but the total length stays the same because you still keep the crankshaft pulley, which then powers the various compressors like AC and the compressor for free valve. You might even use it for, I don't know, a water pump pulley or something. Uh, so the total length stays the same. You just remove the top chunk the top half of the length and even the height i don't see how you reduce it dramatically because the solenoid is a relatively large chunk of you know metal and even the rail that goes above that takes up space too but let's assume that you know height is reduced by a significant amount this might be a for example a big deal for boxer engines but you know it's not like we haven't already installed boxer engines into many different cars and this is the other key point of why free valve isn't a game changer and it's because nothing new and major will be made possible by free valve that was impossible before even if free valve would somehow magically become mainstream no new groundbreaking technology would be possible solely because of free valve and even engine size and weight is an area of very diminishing returns. We don't really have a problem with engine size and weight anymore because nowadays we have one liter three cylinders with a turbocharger powering everything from a hatchback to an MPV. Turbocharging has made engine downsizing very possible. So engines aren't even big anymore. And we don't even have space constraints because uh, vehicle safety regulations have made cars pretty bubbly so you can fit pretty tall engines into pretty much anything that's on the road today and engines are also pretty lightweight nowadays because of clever alloys lots of plastics so even that is still very much diminishing returns so let's sum it up is free valve amazing you bet it is is it worth it well that's an entirely different question it may be a thing for boutique hypercars with ridiculous price tags but the possibility of free valve venturing beyond this tiny market segment in the foreseeable future is very very low so there you have it a depressing video actually i don't think this is a depressing video i think this is a positive video because it shows us just how far we have come and how amazing the stuff we already have and are taking for granted is